sanctuary. The capital of Argentina rises on the vast Pampas plains that meet the foothills of the Andes. In 1580, several dozen pioneers from Asuncion navigated 1,000 kilometers of South American rivers and established the first permanent settlement at what their leader, the conquistador Juan de Garay, named Buenos Aires for the fair winds that greeted mariners there. De Garay immediately set about planning a grid emanating from the Plaza de Mayo, which remains the spiritual center of Argentina. Today, Buenos Aires, or BA for short, is the most prominent and expansive urban grid in the world. Not even Manhattan adheres to this design principle over as large an area. But for its first 200 years, Buenos Aires was a sleepy colony of Spain, considered too far away to justify much attention. The Spanish compounded this remoteness by decreeing that it could only trade with one other port, its colony at Callao, on the other side of the continent. This and the problem of pirates that stole from any vessel without a military escort drove up both the price of goods and the length of time they took to arrive. With frustration mounting against the faraway Spanish crown at the turn of the 19th century, the British saw an opening to invade. But the people of Buenos Aires, who call themselves porteños, used guerrilla tactics to expel them twice, in 1806 and 1807, with little direct help from Spain, victories that convinced the porteños to push for independence. Within three years, they had expelled the Spanish viceroy. Over the next century, all trade into and out of the surrounding provinces was funneled through Buenos Aires, which turbocharged its growth. In the 1850s, crops from far and wide flowed into its factories and warehouses on newly built railroads, creating the need to build South America's first wholesale market, stock exchange, and railway station. With the advent of refrigerated ships, the international export of Argentina's high-quality beef took off. With foreign investment pouring in, word spread that it was becoming a world-class metropolis. Between 1870 and 1895, BA's population exploded from 90,000 to 670,000 as an influx of immigrants arrived from Italy and Spain. This mix of striving people packed into a new, densely populated place was the perfect recipe for the birth of tango, a passionate dance that embodies the heart and soul of Buenos Aires. The city's leaders fully embraced the fusion of South American and European styles. Today, its architecture is eclectic but distinctly Parisian, as are its wide boulevards, especially 9th of July Avenue, the widest street in the world, which required the demolition of dozens of blocks and took half a century to complete. Another impressive build was the metro, known locally as Soup Day, the oldest underground transit system in the Southern Hemisphere. When Argentina's provinces were unified, Buenos Aires led the country to one of the most spectacular increases in prosperity in world history. Within 60 years, it had become the seventh wealthiest nation on Earth, with a per capita GDP bigger than France and Germany. Then the party ended as quickly as it began. World War I forced European investors to move their money back home to help win the bloody conflict at their doorstep which meant less money crossing the ocean into Argentina. The stock market crash of 1929 was the final blow to the export-dependent economy of Buenos Aires. With little public trust left in the government, the military seized control, the first of 10 revolts or coups that have taken place over the last century, abrupt changes in leadership that have resulted in chronic instability. This constant interruption of the continuity of government administrations, combined with the crush of people that arrived throughout the 1800s, severely challenged the ability of porteños to plan and construct adequate housing. During World War II, Buenos Aires again struggled mightily to find buyers for its exports, which forced millions in Argentina's rural areas into poverty. Many people had no choice but to migrate to the capital in search of work nearly tripling the city's population. This swelling urban poor was the perfect audience for populist Lieutenant General Juan Perón, who won the presidency in 1946. New technology like microphones and speakers 
allowed Perón to stage massive rallies in the Plaza de Mayo that were broadcast by radio to the entire country. This gave him the power to nationalize large industries and create Argentina's first welfare state. But it was Perón's glamorous wife, Eva Duarte, who truly captured the hearts of the people by championing the rights of laborers, women, and the poor. Like many who reach cultural immortality, Evita died young in 1952 from cancer. Three million porteños attended her state funeral. But Perón's political power never reached the same heights without her by his side. Since then, for more than the last half century, Buenos Aires has developed at a pace well behind the top-tier global cities it once rivaled 100 years ago. Leaders have tried various schemes to reignite economic growth and establish political stability since the 80s, but none have succeeded. Currently, the capital is gripped by runaway inflation and has had to take IMF loans worth tens of billions of dollars. To repay them, painful cuts to the Argentinian budget seem likely. Still, there's a lot to feel good about if you're a porteño. The port is still one of the largest and busiest on the continent, and experts think the specter of military intervention that has haunted the capital's politics for decades is likely a thing of the past thanks to years of spending less than 1% of GNP on its armed forces. Some of this savings has instead gone to improving life in the capital's slums as most streets have now been paved, which importantly allows buses in so residents can get around more conveniently. Cables have been laid to connect them to the electricity grid, and new public schools and banks have opened. The University of Buenos Aires is one of the best in South America. It has produced four Nobel Prize winners and provides taxpayer-funded education to students from all over the world. Argentina also has nearly 20 million tons of identified lithium reserves in the Andean Plains. This metal is a central component in the batteries of EVs and mobile devices. It's a resource worth more than a trillion dollars to Argentina in the next two decades alone. However, mining it in a way that delivers economic benefits to the whole country without ruining the environment will be a major challenge. Culturally, Buenos Aires remains influential on the world stage. In fact, the beloved Pope Francis is a born and bred porteño. The city's other religion is football. With at least 24 clubs, Buenos Aires has the highest concentration of pro teams in the world and is home to the 2022 World Cup champions, the third time the Argentinian national team has lifted the trophy. BA is also considered the city of books with more bookstores per person than anywhere else on the planet, including one that's been named the most beautiful in the world. Clearly, it's a city of thinkers. In fact, it has more psychologists per inhabitant than anywhere else. This pro-intellectual and open-minded culture features the largest number of theaters in the world, including one of the best opera houses and a spectacular national cultural center that is the largest in Latin America. Among the many performance spaces in this repurposed grand old post office is the large auditorium known as the Blue Whale. To dampen noise and vibration from the metro that runs right below, the theater is suspended in the center of the building without touching any floors or walls. Porteños are also champions of individual freedom. The World Health Organization has praised Argentina for its laws protecting transgender rights. This followed the 1994 change to the national constitution that made Buenos Aires an autonomous city, instead of being ruled by the federal government as it had been for more than a century. This allowed porteños to elect their own mayor, instead of having the president decide who runs their city. Today, with the footprint of the metropolis largely built out, its economic focus has shifted from manufacturing to services like finance and real estate. And it's already fairly easy to traverse using public transport, bicycle, or on foot. So improvements to quality of life could focus on increasing the number of parks, as BA's green space per person is well below the UN recommendation. These areas can also help with flood control. It's become a major problem during heavy rains, as the concrete jungle has expanded into low-lying areas and even out into the river estuary. Last January, a heat wave took out parts of the electricity grid, cutting power to almost a million people. Covering the city's many rooftops and solar panels, 
seems like a sensible solution. But these are just some of the most obvious improvements to an outsider like me. The fundamental question facing Buenos Aires is how to continually improve the standard of living in a megacity that's so far away from the rest of the developed world.